guy in surf was, and he says, never heard of it. <laughs> he says, oh, that's I don't care what it is, I'm going to buy it from you. He bought, a, he oh, bought almost $1,200 worth of gear from me. Fantastic. And so I learned, I learned long before that never to talk about the competition. You know, I privately amongst uh, friends or something, you know, I'll say something bad about Mel, and he's out of business now, so we yeah. can talk about him. Yeah. But when he is in business, I respected him. Good competition never hurt anybody. And we, like Dick Bonin, got kind of mad because my brother and I went into the manufacturing business. He says, "What if I came down and put a store right across from me?" I said, "There's one for lease right over there. I own it." <laughs> And uh, when Morgan got mad at me the other day, he says, I'm going to go into the ski diving business, very, the retail sales business, very big. And he says, you know, I said, Bev, is that a threat? He says, no, I'm just going to do it. And I said, well, fine, Morgan, I wish you a lot of success. I said, if you want to get into this, the retail sales, I have a building across the street there to find Jibbo Rancho. You know, he was burned up, and I'm sure he's kind of forget about it. He's not there. I never had a real violent argument with Bev. I got along better with him than I did with my own brother. Because when there's a three-way partnership, you argue, yeah. you, you know, the person's close to it. And it wasn't that close to Morgan, so we didn't argue that much. You know? Like, I've never had an argument with Don Severs. We, we just have a... Yeah, we have people like that. We, have a, we don't agree on any, any, anything, so we just don't talk about that. We, yeah. we just didn't want to build a submarine because I wanted to build a free-floating one. He wanted to build a crawler. Yeah. And I didn't want anything to do with a crawler. Now he built a free-floating thing, so I had to buy back into the depth. <laughs> Robert Marks. Anything Bob Marks, I don't know. I've only met him once, I think. I've uh, had a few things to do to him with him. I sent a compressor down to him. Uh, for, uh, I think I sent three hooper rigs for Claire Blair, the uh, editor of Saturday Evening Post at the time. And a great friend of mine, Wally Bennett, who was with Time Magazine, went down. And he and Marks and Claire were the first ones to dive on some of those old galleons down there. And Mark's always appreciated the same gun. I sent him a gun for your charge to try out. I was building a, I was manufacturing a spear gun at the time. Oh, yeah, what was that? Yeah. It was, a, it was an all aluminum gun. We couldn't get Wally Potts to build anymore, so a guy named Dennis, Dennis, Hard Dennis built it for us. And we built about 500 of them. And they were really good guns. They were all aluminum with stainless steel, uh, hard anodized aluminum with stainless steel triggers. And we were the first ones to come with that groove in there. And uh, Voight has their guns built like that, Super Bowl has. We were the first ones to groove the actual barrel. And, uh, so that one in the archives? Uh, there's a stainless steel one around here someplace. How about Jordan Klein? Jordan Klein, I don't know, know him at all. Will he be known for anything? In no, I don't think so. Is that me? 221. Yeah, cut that me. This is a continuation of uh, the interview with Bob Maestro. And we are April 2nd, 1975, and we left off with Jordan Klein as one of the names to react to. Okay, well, where we, um, we left off, you got a big rush on something. Just like you got a big rush on the day. Yeah, you're not that's all right. That. So I can, we ought to be able to do it in <laughs> I don't know those people. Right? I was listening to those people, uh, and they wanted you. You know, they want yeah. you to walk through and touch it. Well, let them look, a, look at a few boats. Yeah, but well, they want you to go there and touch it with them. You know, I mean, that's yeah. what they really want. They really want to, to have that feeling they bought, bought it from you. It's interesting. I, I know we mentioned this. That, uh, when somebody comes down, I know in the early days, of course, they really want to talk to Bill. Yeah. The Maestro Brothers, the Maestro Liz. Is this still pretty much? It's still that way. Billy gets an awful lot of calls up there. You know, he runs more or less the wholesale department. Yeah. And then we had now we have have the regulators and the valves and everything else, and uh, they call up and ask for him. But down here they call up and ask for myself or Richard Hernandez, and that little guy that's running that thing they call up and ask for him. It's mm -hmm. boats, motors, and skis and stuff. They he call him, stuff. Him, especially skis. He knows. Richard's the one that brought the people across the street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and you've had how long has he been with you? He's been with me for about six or seven years. <clears throat> so he's pretty well taken on some of the R of oh, yeah. brothers. So they. Yeah, hey, you know, everybody's starting to take on the slack. They like a lot of people call them that want to talk to Jim. And now that we have uh, in store instructors, you know, we have full time instructors working in the stores. How long has that been? 
Uh, we've been trying that for three or four years, and this is the first time that we've had, uh, uh, well, no, we've had them for three or four years, but this is the first time that we just had uh, cut out all outside instruction. And Don Morris and Herb don't teach for me anymore, and they're a little bit puckered about it, but they just don't sell the gear, and I think that selling the gear is one of the most important things in diving. That's why we have the 90%. No, no, wait a minute, no. You said safety first and then... Safe, but, but I mean... <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but, all right, well, yeah, but after safety, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the county never liked for you to sell any gear, recommend any equipment or anything. But the 90% dropout in, in diving is because the people didn't buy any equipment to begin with. Mm -hmm. Consequently, they didn't go diving very often. And when they have to rent and borrow and, and, uh, and uh, use all kinds of used equipment, then they're never familiar with that equipment. This way, if a guy starts buying his equipment, the minute he gets into the class, and goes all the way through the class, by the time he gets to the ocean, ocean trip, he knows his equipment real well. And he gets a chance to use all the different types of equipment in the pool. And he can go back there, and it's his instructor he's talking to. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think he can, uh, you can do that with a private instructor, because they don't know that much about equipment. And I'm, I'm really amazed at how much the private instructor knows about equipment when he comes out of the, co the school up there at the L.A. County, you know. This has been the, one of the big weaknesses then. In I think so. Certification instructors, they really don't know equipment like that. We do. keep up on the equipment, and sure, you're going to have shops that sell nothing but a bunch of slot gear because that's where the profit is, but uh, on a legitimate dive shop that wants to get that customer to come back and use, use, you as, uh, use your shop word of mouth and encourage other people to come down, You've got to give him good equipment, and uh, you know you you won't you won't be selling the stuff that you make the most profit on because it's a bunch of junk. Now the fellows, you are these the same fellows so you had now for? No, months? these uh, I got two newer guys now. Uh, the other guys, uh, Harvey, used to be in charge. He's quitting, going back and work for his dad. And then Rob Ferrer was the same guy. His dad owns a multi-million dollar operation. He got retired working for it. They come down here, and the change of money is just too much for him, and they can't survive on it. So then they well, get. You know, I mean, obviously they must make more than just a clerk, sales clerk. They well, they, they make a good salary. We pay a good salary, and I have a profit sharing plan. I have a medical plan. I have a dental plan for them. Oh, wow. And uh, I have a real good dental plan. I give every employee $50 to take care of his teeth every year. That's and he, he don't get it unless I attend it to the doctor. So he has to go to the dentist once a year. And he can spend up. we pay all, all the expenses up to $50. Anything over that, he has to pay. But this keeps a, you know, keeps a maintenance program on their teeth, and I think it's better than any other because most dental plans, um, they have to pay the first $100. Right. Well, most people don't spend $100 on their teeth a year, you know, right. unless it's a major problem. And if they do get over, the, you know, if they do find out it's going to be 100 they won't, they won't have it done. The people we have working at the yeah. suit department. Yeah. We've got about 50 employees now, and it's just, it's just, um, that dental plan has turned out to be the best thing. And then a profit sharing plan, everybody gets into that after three years here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they get paid highest prices for classes. I pay $25 for a three hour class. And uh, they don't have to lug any equipment back oh, and forth. That March in in addition to their sales? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they get $35 for a beach dive and $35 for a boat trip. You know, And those mm -hmm. can be fun if you have nice students yeah. in the class. You know. Now, on what basis now? <laughs> this is a person now. You don't just hire a salesperson now. You hire a salesperson who's also been instructed. Yeah. Well, we we have to make a salesman out of them. Like we took two guys right out of the Brawley School, I and see. that's where we've been getting ours. We, we're, oh, really? we're talking to a couple from NASDS, which which are starting to really really come up. When good. did the first happen? When did you first hire somebody like this? It was a sales uh, instructor. I think uh, about three years ago. But see, we we had Dana in our organization here for about five or six, seven years, and he he became an instructor, and then he you know he was already a clerk, and then he became an expert. So he was a salesman first, and then an instructor. And he didn't oversell anybody. It's impossible to oversell somebody. Yeah. You know, if you sold him two or three watches and four or five duck gauges and stuff like that, that's overselling. But as long as that guy's got one good piece of equipment on, he's not oversold. But this three years ago, was, now you, you hired somebody who was an instructor and made a salesperson out of him. Right. All right. Now, what, who was that? And how did, who was uh, that was, I think, the first guy that we we uh, hired on that basis was Rob Ferreira. And why did why did you do that? Well, because uh, we just thought that uh, he, uh, Brawley pretty well, he keeps those people in that college up there for, for I think it's two months. And How did you, uh, they work in the what school. turned you on to the Brawley? Well, um, 
John, John, Gaffney. John Gaffney really turned me on to that program, mm -hmm. but I didn't interview any instructors that I really liked from his place, see. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you got to understand that they're, they're, these guys are kind of misfits, really, mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, they, a lot they've had a lot of chances to do things, and they've traveled, and yeah. they've died, and everything, and, and uh, like Rob Ferrer and, and Harvey, both of theirs, they couldn't get along with their fathers in business, so they quit, and they thought, well, I'll get into the diving. So they came out and took golly school, and they came down and went to work for me. And it turned out pretty good. Uh, who put you in contact with the ones from Broadway? They just came in. They heard about dive and surf, and they, they just started down the coast and hit every shop. And Broadway probably told them that I had one, one large good shop. And what were the things uh, that <coughs> impressed you that in hiring somebody like that? Well, they know a lot about equipment, mm -hmm. and they're very good instructors. They teach some of the things I don't like, and that's what we weeded out. Before they went to work for me, they had to go through a series of a bunch of classes back there with their other instructors, and then they have to go on so many beach dives and so many boat trips and so many open to boat trips. To get the diving surf system. To get the diving, to pour on letting back there in the class and start teaching. Mm -hmm. What was I, it that you didn't like that they were? Well, <clears throat> one of the things I don't like, I don't like turning off the air and having the guy make the free ascent to the surface. I don't see that it accomplishes a hell of a lot. If they want to turn the air off to let the guy experience running out of here in open water fine, but then turn it back on so he's got a way out when he goes to the surface. Mm -hmm. I could just see yourself going into court and the judge says, I explain your technique and the guy says, Well first I turned his ear off. That that the engine right there, you'd be dead. And I've tried to tell John and I tried to tell Brawley and they both said, Well, you know, never have had an accident. That one in Santa Cruz was the first accident of that type. I don't really think it accomplishes that much. And they're almost they're almost going to a different technique. They don't even want to teach free ascents with the mouth, mouthpiece out of the mouth. They want them to leave the mouthpiece in, which is the way I teach people to practice free ascents the rest of their life, is to keep the mouthpiece in. Head up, and if you fail to make it all the way to the surface, I hope you exhale too much and not enough, mm. rather than not enough, then you can just go ahead and take a breath and practice from there. Every time I dive, I practice free ascents. Well, that's interesting. I've become an expert at it. And every time I dive anything over 50 foot, I've decompressed at 10 feet for, for the last 10 years. I think that's a damn good habit to get into. Very good. Can't hurt you. And you get some experience of keeping yourself at 10 feet, and you can practice buddy breathing and hand signals and stuff there. And nobody ever does anything with that air anyhow, so you might as well use it up at 10 feet. You know. What was the uh, what person in that did you trust most at that time to? show the system to these new people. Well, Dana Mundi was the guy that was in charge of the whole thing. And he really did an excellent job. Where is he now? He wanted to get in law enforcement and he was going to, first he was going to be a doctor, then he was going to be um, mm -hmm. an engineer, mm -hmm. and he's a very intelligent, smart guy. And then he wanted to get in law enforcement. He worked for the most Beach Police Department. Mm -hmm. Is he still involved in diving? No, not at all. He has a boat and he still dives, but he doesn't instruct. He got out of it. But he was one of the outstanding instructors. Yeah, that you he was an outstanding guy. Mm -hmm. Very good worker, very efficient. So, anyway, these two fellows you hired then turned out to be very good at the whole thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And that gave you the feeling then that you should hire a good instructor who has some real good equipment knowledge and right. then give them. The, the sales system that you use? Nobody that can <coughs> prove to me that they make money on classes. Maybe Haddon Fun Scuba does, and maybe this new new stuff that's starting down in Orange County does, but that's what's got the LA County mm -hmm. ordinance on the books, is those programs. Nobody can sit down and say, hey, we made money on classes. I can show you in our financial statement we lost $12,000 in three months on classes and boat charters. And the only reason why I have a charter boat is to take my classes to Catalina. And you think on the open water boat trips you'd make some money, but it's just fuel and insurance and labor and cost and maintenance and everything. So it has to be on sales. So it's just a total waste of money to have a class and to uh, have a boat. So they're really loss leaders for you. Yeah. They're, they're, they've always been. Over the years, they've just lost constantly. It's one of the things that never got out of the red. And it's because uh, you maintain a, a quality control. If you didn't do that, you might be able to stop <coughs> it and make it. Well, money. if you would. Uh, like we went up to, to seventy-five dollars on our classes, but we teach eight lessons in the pool now. We teach a beach dive with skin diving gear. We teach a beach dive with scuba gear, and we teach two ocean boat trips, all eight boat trips to Catalina with scuba. And that's just not dump the guy in the water like the old days and then let him go for the rest of the day. He has exercises he goes through for two complete dives, 
and if he feels like making a third dive, he can. The boat trips alone cost me thirty thirty four dollars. So you're teaching the class for pennies, you know. It's just yes, piano lessons or more. Is the worst loss on the class itself or on the boat trip? Probably on the class itself because of the pool maintenance and the high insurance and the, the you know you can you you've heard of guys working for two dollars and fifty cents an hour and all the free air they can get. Mm -hmm. Well, I just yeah. won't I won't get into that thing. I pay a guy a decent wage. The wage.